I'm Derek Dreyer. I'm the director of the Rosenbeck. I'm going to read a passage from chapter 16, Eumaeus. This is toward the end of this great book, Ulysses. Bloom and Stephen have been having a long conversation. They've been dropping all kinds of names in that conversation. They've been talking about high culture. They've been using phrases in French and Latin and German. Of course, they don't really understand those phrases. They may not really even know who the names are they've been dropping. And so their effort to show us how cultured they are kind of fails. And we see that at the end of this chapter as the narrator shifts the focus away from these two men concluding their conversation as they walk off into the night and instead shows us the perspective of a street sweeper and his horse. On the roadway which they were approaching, while still speaking beyond the swing chains, a horse, dragging a sweeper, paced on the paven ground, brushing a long swathe of mire up so that with the noise, Bloom was not perfectly certain whether he had caught or right the allusion to 65 guineas and John Bull. He inquired if it was John Bull, the political celebrity of that ilk, as it struck him, the two identical names, as a striking coincidence. By the chains, the horse slowly swerved to turn, which, perceiving Bloom, who was keeping a sharp lookout as usual, plucked the other's sleeve gently, jocosely remarking, Our lives are in peril tonight. Beware of the steamroller. They thereupon stopped. Bloom looked at the head of a horse, not worth anything like 65 guineas. Suddenly in evidence in the dark, quite near, so that it seemed new, a different grouping of bones and even flesh, because probably it was a forewalker, a hip shaker, a black buttocker, a tail dangler, a head hanger, putting his hind foot foremost while the lord of his creation sat on the perch, busy with his thoughts. But such a good poor brute, he was sorry he hadn't a lump of sugar, but as he wisely reflected, you could scarcely be prepared for every emergency that might crop up. He was just a big, nervous, foolish, noodly kind of horse, without a second care in the world. But even a dog, he reflected, take that mongrel and Barney Kiernan's of the same size, would be a holy horror to face. But it was no animal's fault in particular if he was built that way like the camel, ship of the desert, distilling grapes into potheen and his hump. Nine-tenths of them all could be caged or trained. Nothing beyond the art of man, barring the bees. Whale with a harpoon hairpin. Alligator tickled the small of his back, and he sees the joke. Chalk a circle for a rooster. Tiger, my eagle eye. These timely reflections anent the brutes of the field occupied his mind, somewhat distracted from Stephen's words while the ship of the street was maneuvering, and Stephen went on about the highly interesting old. What's this I was saying? Ah, yes. My wife, he intimated, plunging in medias res, would have the greatest of pleasure in making your acquaintance as she is passionately attached to music of any kind. He looked sideways in a friendly fashion at the side face of Stephen, image of his mother, which was not quite the same as the usual handsome blackguard type they unquestionably had an insatiable hankering after, as he was perhaps not that way built. Still, supposing he had his father's gift as he more than suspected, it opened up new vistas in his mind, such as Lady Fingal's Irish Industries, concert on the preceding Monday, and aristocracy in general. Exquisite variations he was now describing on an air, Youth Here Has End by Jans Peter Svelink, a Dutchman of Amsterdam where the frowls come from. Even more, he liked an old German song of Johannes Jaep about the clear sea and the voices of sirens, sweet murderers of men, which boggled Bloom a bit. Von der Sirenen Listigkeit tun die Poeten dichten. These opening bars he sang and translated extempore. Bloom, nodding, said he perfectly understood and begged him to go on by all means, which he did. A phenomenally beautiful tenor voice like that, the rarest of boons, which 
Bloom appreciated the very first note he got out, could easily, if properly handled by some recognized authority on voice production, such as Barraclough, and being able to read music into the bargain, command its own price, where baritones were ten a penny, and procure for its fortunate possessor in the near future an entree into fashionable houses in the best residential quarters of financial magnates in a large way of business and titled people where with his university degree of B.A., a huge ad in its way, and gentlemanly bearing to all the more influence the good impression he would infallibly score a distinct success, being blessed with brains which could also be utilized for the purpose and other requisites if his clothes were properly attended to so as the better to worm his way into their good graces as he, a youthful tyro in society's sartorial niceties, hardly understood how a thing like that could militate against you. It was in fact only a matter of months and he could easily foresee him participating in their musical and artistic conversaciones during the festivities of the Christmas season, for choice, causing a slight flutter in the dovecots of the fair sex and being made a lot of by ladies out for sensation, cases of which, as he happened to know, were on record. In fact, Without giving the show away, he himself, once upon a time, if he cared to, could easily have. Added to which, of course, would be the pecuniary emolument, by no means to be sneezed at, going hand in hand with his tuition fees. Not, he parenthesized, that for the sake of filthy lucre, he need necessarily embrace the lyric platform as a walk in life for any lengthy space of time. But a step in the required direction it was, beyond yea or nay, and both monetarily and mentally it contained no reflection on his dignity in the smallest, and it often turned in uncommonly handy to be handed a check at a much-needed moment when every little helped. Besides, though taste latterly had deteriorated to a degree, original music like that, different from the conventional rut, would rapidly have a great vogue as it would be decided novelty for Dublin's musical world after the usual hackneyed run of catchy tenor solos foisted on a confiding public by Ivan St. Austell and Hilton St. Justin, their genus omne. Yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he could with all the cards in his hand, and he had a capital opening to make a name for himself and win a high place in the city's esteem where he could command a stiff figure and, booking ahead, give a grand concert for the patrons of the King Street House, given a backer up if one were forthcoming to kick him upstairs, so to speak. A big if, however, with some impetus of a go-ahead sort to obviate the inevitable procrastination which often tripped up a too much fetid prince of good fellows. And it need not detract from the other by one iota as being his own master, he would have heaps of time to practice literature in his spare moments when desirous of doing so, without its clashing with his vocal career or containing anything derogatory whatsoever as it was a matter for himself alone. In fact, he had the ball at his feet and that was the very reason why the other, possessed of a remarkably sharp nose for smelling a rat of any sort, hung on to him at all. The horse was just then, and later on at a propitious opportunity, he purposed, Bloom did, without any way prying into his private affairs on the fool step in where angels principle, advising him to sever his connection with a certain budding practitioner who, he noticed, was prone to disparage and even to a slight extent, with some hilarious pretext when not present, deprecate him, or whatever you like to call it, which in Bloom's humble opinion threw a nasty sidelight on that side of a person's character. No pun intended. The horse, having reached the end of his tether, so to speak, halted and, rearing high a proud feathering tail, added his quota by letting fall on the floor which the brush would soon brush up and polish three smoking globes of turds. Slowly, three times, one after another, from a full crupper he mired, and humanely his driver waited till he, or she, had ended, patient in his scythed car. 
side by side bloom, profiting by the contretemps, with Stephen passed through the gap of the chains, divided by the upright and stepping over a strand of mire, went across towards Gardner Street lower, Stephen singing more boldly, but not loudly, the end of the ballad. Und alle Schiffe brücken. The driver never said a word, good, bad, or indifferent, but merely watched the two figures as he sat on his low-backed car. Both black, one full, one lean, walked towards the railway bridge to be married by Father Marr. As they walked, they at times stopped and walked again, continuing their tete-a-tete, -tete, which, of course, he was utterly out of about sirens, enemies of man's reason, mingled with a number of other topics of the same category, usurpers, historical cases of the kind, while well, the man in the sweeper car, or you might as well call it in the sleeper car, who in any case couldn't possibly hear because they were too far simply, sat in his seat near the end of Lower Gardner Street and looked after their low-backed car. Happy Bloomsday.